So, Lord, we pray that you would build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. I think we just said that. And then something about with your mighty hand. And God, Jesus said this weird thing. He said, the kingdom of God is at hand. So maybe you could help us, I don't know, believe that. In, in Jesus' name, we ask this. Amen. Yeah, you know, we can find a hotel, but after that, I don't know what, what else is there to do. Yeah, you know what, you guys? We've pretty much seen everything. A little miniature golf place. Yeah. And we have a bowling but we have a bowling alley at home. Hey, you might as well go home to do that. Roller skating ring. We can roller skate at home too. Well, what else could we do? Live in the playground. No, we got playgrounds at home. We can play here. Hey, what's to the if we stayed on Interstate 70 and just kept driving, where would we go? Well, you keep on going far enough, you get the other side of the United States, the east side. Take, if you want to get even hotter, you can then take the interstates angling down. I don't know. I think go to it's Florida. hot enough here. It's hot enough here? Okay. How far is Florida? Oh, let's see, about 1,500 miles. 1,500. What do they have? What did that be like? What do they have in Florida? I don't know. You know anything that's in Florida? Alligators? Yeah. Uh, I wonder. Crocodiles. Crocodiles. Anything to do to play there? Um, Disney World? Yeah. Oh, hey, you want to go to Disney World? I'd rather be here. What? You'd rather be here? John, do you want to go to Disney World? I'll think about that one. Yeah. You think about it? Well, we'll stay here if you want. But okay. Yeah, I'm totally serious. We're driving two more days to Disney World. And then we're going to go to the beach. How many days I'm going to follow that's what I showed you uh, last week. And if you've been around here for the last uh, 30 years, you've probably seen it uh, several times. Um, I just love it. I, I could watch that video seriously a million times. I love how Elizabeth tries to control Coleman. Do you see that? So Coleman punches Elizabeth, and Elizabeth punches Coleman, but pulls her punch because she knows she'll, she'll get in, in trouble. I ache for John uh, sitting there with his disposable camera and, you know, that look on his face as if he's thinking, this is confusing and this is kind of a disappointing vacation. I love how Becky, in her usual dreamy way, just says, the bowling alley. And I love how Coleman, the adrenaline junkie, just pumps his fist and cries out, play in the park. I love that video. I could watch it a million times, and yet it rips at my heart if I watch it just once, because I just want to scream out, that was so good. It just can't go away. They were all at home at Christmas. It was awesome. And yet it wasn't the same, because they were not three, six, eight, and nine. They were 29, 32, 34, and 35. And then I think, oh man, and they're never going to be 29, 32, 34, and 35 again at Christmas. I love that video, but it's not the same for you. It's not your family. It's not familiar to you. So some of you are thinking, nice family, but uh, could we watch something else? Some of you are jealous. You're thinking, I wish my family was like that family. Some of you may be proud. You're thinking, I have better home movies than Peter. I bet all of you are all of the above because I would be if I were you. I mean, you can't live my life. And I can't live your life. Can I? I absolutely love the video. And yet, you know, when I was filming it, when I was filming, filming it right, right here in, in this moment, I was absolutely hating it. That's why I shut off the camera. Uh, because it wasn't going according to my script. It wasn't matching my expectations for that particular moment. So I shut off the camera and I just said to the kids, ah, just get in the van, just get in the van. 
It was then that I had the thought that I think came from God and was for me, hey, Peter, now you know what it's like, you know, for me, being your daddy. Last week, we talked about the fact that my kids' dreams were not too big, but they were actually too small. Their hopes were not too strong, but too weak. And we said that's understandable because Junction City was right there. It was in their grasp. The Magic Kingdom was like a painful van ride away, kind of like, you know, a bottle of wine is in your grasp. But the wine of the kingdom, not. Porn, gossip, whoa, that's in your grasp. But a real relationship with a real person, not so much. Kind of like religion, it's in your grasp but not Jesus. Or at least not in the way that you expected him to be, right? It's not like wine is bad, sex is bad, or religion is bad. In fact, all of those things are sacraments. They're all signs of the kingdom, but how we take them and hang on to them turns those sacraments into idols that trap us in the park in Junction City for like a moment or many moments in, in time, our space and time. In Junction City, my children had to surrender their dream, the one that they could control, for my dream, the one that they couldn't control. They had to surrender hope, hope for the park, you know. They had to surrender hope and let it die but not so that it would go away. They had to surrender it like a seed, an imperishable seed planted in the ground so that it would die and live, so that it would grow into a kingdom, a magic kingdom. You get that. Junction City was in their grasp. The magic kingdom was a painful van right away, so get in the van did sound just like pick up a cross and come follow. Last week, I told you how my kids originally had this dream of a magic kingdom in a whole new world, Disney World. I told you how a friend gave me a gift. I realized that we could go as long as we drove and how I mapped out the course and realized that we'd be driving through Junction City, my birthplace, on our way to Disney World. I told you how they pressed for news one day about vacation, and then I said, we're going to Kansas. We're Junction City, Kansas. And, and they all said, Wow. I told you how I set the whole thing up so I could surprise them in Junction City with the news about the Magic Kingdom because I cherished that moment of revelation and I figured that I would capture that moment on film. I just knew that when they heard the news, they would dance around in delirious joy singing, we're going to Disney World, we're going to Disney World. Whoop, my microphone fell off, but they'd be singing, I'll put it in my pocket, we're going to Disney World, we're going to Disney World. Daddy, I love you. But, as you saw in the video, they did not. And so I finally just shut off the camera and said, just get in the van. And begrudgingly, they got in the van. Now, I don't want to minimize that. Because it takes faith to get in the van. It takes faith to, to plant a seed. If you think about it, if you're a farmer. In Junction City, they made a choice. Or maybe I made that choice in them. Or I had been making that choice in them their entire lives. It was faith in me and in Susan. Or you could say it was our faithfulness to them and now in them that made them trust us just long enough to get in the van. Even though it hurt, we suffered it together and we all got in the van. So why the journey? Why the stop in Junction City on the way? Why this life? Why all the painful choices on the way to the magic kingdom? As I said last week, I cannot fully answer that question. But as I told you last week, our stop in Junction City made the magic kingdom all that more magic. It happened over and, and over again once we arrived. The kids would look up at me and say, I can't believe that I wanted to stay in Junction City. I love you, Daddy. It means I have faith in you. I'm hoping in you. I love you. 
Faith, hope, and love grow in the van. Faith, hope, and love are what make the magic kingdom magic. In the absence of faith, hope, and love, the magic kingdom isn't magic, but hell. I mean, you've been there at times like that, right? Hell number one, the weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's funny, but my kids have never expressed a desire to go back to Disney World. But they will often reminisce about our time in the van. They miss the magic kingdom in the van. 1 Peter 3, verse 18, this is our third time reading these verses, for Christ also suffered once, or once and for all, for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us, you know, like a van, to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to preach to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, seven plus one, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as removal of dirt from the body or the flesh, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience or consciousness through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Last week, we noticed that the Bible is just full of journeys that begin with baptisms. We effectively baptize our kids in Junction City by making them get in the van. They died to Junction City and began to live for the magic kingdom. In the ark, Noah and the seven died to the old world and began a 40-day journey to a new world a world that was with them in the ark like a seed. In the same way, Moses and Israel, according to Paul, were baptized in the Red Sea and began a 40-year journey to a promised land, a magic kingdom. They were on a journey to a destination, and this destination was also with them like a seed. It was the ark of the covenant kept in an inner sanctuary, which was, according to the book of Hebrews, the very presence of the age to come. So, in Noah's ark, there was a new world, and in the inner sanctuary of the tabernacle was the ark of the covenant, which is the presence of eternity, the age to come. And now, we just learned that Jesus is the ark. And we are all baptized into Jesus, who was baptized in the Jordan, the edge of the promised land, but began a 40-day journey into the wilderness where he was tempted uh, by the devil, but he conquered the temptations of the devil unlike the first Adam. Jesus is called the eschatos Adam. Over and over again in Scripture, we're told to put on Christ and reminded that we are actually in Christ. It's not just a metaphor. Jesus is the van. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, the flesh, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience or consciousness through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice that for Peter, as well as for Paul, it's not the death of Jesus that saves you. If Jesus just died and didn't rise, writes Paul in 1 Corinthians, you would still be in your sins. You're not saved because God killed Jesus in your place. You're saved because God raised Jesus in your place. He is your appeal to God. He is your faith, hope, and love. You conquer the devil conscious of the fact that he's in you, and you are in him. He's the van. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right. There's this crazy verse where Paul says we are seated in the heavenly places. In Anyway, okay. Right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased, stopped, Shabbat, Sabbath, from sin. 
so as to live or move for the rest of the time, the chronos, in the flesh, no longer in human passions, but in the will of God. Remember, Jesus is the will of God. And the passion, passion, you saw the movie, Passion of God. For the chronos that is past, time that is past, Suffice, it's sufficient for doing the will of the unfaithful, moving about in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you not now join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give, give back account, literally logos, so give back the logos to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That though judged in the flesh, the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. I hope you just noticed that Peter just referred to the gospel as the judgment and salvation. We're going to the magic kingdom. That's gospel and judgment and salvation. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who were dead, who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end, the telos of all things is at hand. If there is an end to all things, then all things are on a journey to that end. And the only thing that does not come to an end is the end. And Jesus said, I am the end. And the beginning. I am the end, the tell us. Just as I mapped out our route from Denver to Junction City and on to the Magic Kingdom, you see, I think our Father mapped out our route from the beginning to now and on to the end. Genesis chapter 1 describes six days of creation, kind of like six hours of driving. On the sixth day, man is made in the image of God. On the seventh day, God rests, and all creation rests. For everything is very good. So if you're not at rest, if for you everything is not very good, then everything is not finished, and we must still be on a journey to the seventh day, when and where everything is very good. The seventh day doesn't start until Jesus, the word, the will, the judgment, the goodness, the life of God, cries out, it is finished, to tell us die. It's to tell us from a tree in the middle of a garden at the end of the sixth day. At this tree, he gives us his life. And we come to know that God is good. A Christian then lives in time with eternity in their heart. Eternity in their heart growing like a, a, a tree in a garden in their heart. This means that the deepest story is not that God made everything good. We mess it up and now God is trying to fix things with Jesus. Going, gosh, I hope this works out. It means that the deepest story is that God is making us in his own image with his word, who is Jesus, and he will not fail. It means that he is taking us all on a journey, and we will arrive at our destination, although now we find ourselves at a junction. We can get stuck in Junction City for a time, which turns into hell number one. Or we can get into the van, which feels like hell number three. <laughs> it's the judgment. It's the choice. But in the van is the presence of the future, which, you know, we described as hell number two. I mean, the eternal fire, the end that is at hand. Our Father, it's our Father in His van, and Jesus is the van. If you saw a guy with a sandwich board and a sign that said, repent, the end of all things is at hand, what would you think of? 
Well, you'd think of some kind of Rambo kick-ass Jesus, right? Kicking some ass. Like we learned on Christmas Eve from old Simeon, Jesus does do something like that. And yet, Hebrews 13.8, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 9.26, listen really closely to this, this verse. He already has appeared, or it doesn't say it that way, but it says he appeared once and for all at the end of the ages uh, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. On us, the end of the ages has come, writes Paul. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity, writes Peter. The eternal day is the endless day that is the end. Some people think chronological time just goes on forever without end. Some have actually written to me convinced that God saves all and yet terrified of being saved. For they think it just goes on forever without end. And so everything will just get oh, infinitely old and infinitely boring. Some people think because the beginning is also the end, time, you know, it moves in a circle which just means that everything will be infinitely boring and infinitely repetitive. Day after day, getting up, getting dressed, going to church, singing more praise songs, going to bed, getting up, going to church, going to church singing more praise signs. That does sound terrifying. In Scripture, Jesus says, I am the end and the beginning and the way. If he wasn't lying to us, that means that not only the beginning and the end are the same thing, but the way, the circle, is also the same thing. And so the circle <laughs> collapses in on itself and it becomes a singularity, which is all of space and time in one point which has no dimensions. Or maybe I should say it contains all dimensions and all of space and time. Whew, crazy. In the 20th century, scientists said, this is weird. <laughs> but it appears as if all things came from a singularity. Call it the, the Big Bang. And, and we don't know what it is. Or we don't know what's on the other side. For technically, there is no other side to... There are no sides. It's an uncaused cause. And one other thing. It appears that there is something like it inside of every person. Call it an observer. Like a consciousness. That seems to be undetermined, but determinate of matter. That is the quantum state of everything. Everything that we once thought was anything. Well, the Bible refers to the mystery beyond, speaking metaphorically now, the Big Bang as God. And that mystery in you as the breath of God in you. And the Bible pictures time as something like this picture on the screen. Six days of chronological time contained within a seventh day, eternity. And modern people, including modern Christians, have stopped believing the Bible. Why? Because they believe in 19th century science. And they trust religious people who say hell is a place where people suffer forever without end. And so we've learned to say things like, well, nice thoughts, Peter, who wrote the Bible, and nice thoughts, Peter, who preached the sermon, but hell, but hell. So we quote the Bible, but don't actually believe the Bible that there is one end of all things. But right now, 
let's just, for a few minutes, take a shot at actually believing that what Jesus said is true. That he is the end and the beginning. It says it twice in, in the Revelation. And the way. I hope you don't take science too seriously. And I hope you don't take my explanations of things too seriously. But I do hope that you take the Bible very seriously. You see, my brain can't comprehend God. Or me and the eternity, the eternity in, in my heart. But, but if I were to re represent time with a diagram, it would be something like, like this. Maybe that line wouldn't be fat, it would be thin, but be kind of like, like this. Karl Barth writes, time does not exist apart from eternity's embrace. Eternity embraces time on all sides preceding, accompanying, and fulfilling it. To say that God is eternal means that God is the one who is and rules before time, in time, and again after time. The one who is not conditioned by time, but conditions it absolutely in his freedom. You can think of number seven up there as a a singularity, a singularity that contains all of space and time and in reality fills all of space and time, making it eternal. In truth, there is nowhere and no when that it is not. And yet we wonder if it is at all, for it is not confined to the flow of time. That is cause and effect. It is, or I should say he is, I am, is the uncaused cause. The end who is the beginning and the way. Uh, the magic that makes the magic kingdom magic. And I think the biblical word for that is holy. Remember when Noah arrived on the magic, uh, or on the mountains? <laughs> they weren't magic in the lands of Ararat. You've read the story. Do you remember what happens right away? Noah gets drunk. His son appears to rape him. I think that's what the text is saying. And Noah curses his descendants. In other words, they have not arrived <laughs> in the new world, the magic kingdom. And, boy, we can talk about this forever. Remember what happened when Israel arrived in the promised land. They were eventually divided, were ultimately exiled. In other words, they hadn't yet arrived or consciously arrived in the magic kingdom. Well, watch the news, and you'll see they still haven't arrived. And remember when we finally arrived at Disney World, like, like I told you, it was pretty great for a time. But after 50 times on Space Mountain, even for my son Jonathan, it got old. And we got grumpy, and we were divided. So it wasn't the substance of the kingdom. It was only like a sign of the kingdom or the form of the kingdom, the empty form of the kingdom. You see, if the end is the beginning and the way, then in reality, there is no separation in space or in time. If there's no separation in space, no one is ever alone. And if there's no separation in time, nothing ever gets old. <laughs> But everything is constantly new. But for us, that just doesn't seem to be true. Think with me. One moment in time is only separated from another moment in time by chronological time. That is the timeline. Another way to say that is to say that uh, the past and the future only exist on the timeline in the apparent absence of eternity. So, so I am now. And I remember this thing called the past, but it really only exists in my mind because it is not where I am. I remember the past and I imagine the future. Neither is where I am. 
And yet, I can be separated from where I am by regretting the past and worrying about the, the future. And when I do that, I don't live now, <laughs> which is where I am. And where I am is. And what exactly is now? Oh, that's frustrating. Because see, it's kind of like a singularity. The moment I observe now, it's no longer now. And I'm divided thinking about me, which is where I am not. Shame can only exist on the timeline, for it is what I feel when I judge me in the past. And fear only exists on the timeline, for it is what I feel when I imagine me in the future, and both of these are pride, for they are my judgments of myself. You know my very first memory in time? It was in Junction City of a moment, um, a moment that, that happened in Junction City. The wallpaper was peeling off the wall above my, my bed. And I remember my mom said, Peter, don't pull on the wallpaper. I remember gaining that knowledge of good and evil and then pulling on the wallpaper. And suddenly, I, I really desired to pull on the wallpaper. I mean, maybe even the moment she said, don't pull on the wallpaper, I wanted to pull on the wallpaper. And then I remember judging myself, separated from myself and from my mother. I was conscious of me alone. I had begun a journey that in many ways, maybe most ways, I'm still on today. But if the end is the beginning and the way, then in reality there is no separation in space or time, space-time. And so none of us is actually alone, even though we feel alone at times on this journey. As, as we've mentioned, hell number one, Hades show, can only exist on the timeline. It's, and now I'm not mapping out the timeline so much as remember the space thing. The, it's Hades, uh, Sheol, it's in time, it's in space. Scripture decides, describes it as the depths of the earth, which, as we know, is surrounded by space, which Scripture calls the heavens. And so what we think is empty is full, and what we think is full is, is empty somehow. Remember what Isaiah saw? He saw this. It's what all the prophets say will happen or has happened. Isaiah wrote, I saw the Lord. We sing this. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple and the seraphim cried out, holy, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. That means hell number one is filled with hell number two. In other words, Hades is filled with heaven, but apparently some of us are unaware of this fact for we're trapped in space and time, that is space time. I love what Albert Einstein said at Niles Bohr's funeral. Now Niles, he has departed from this strange world a little ahead of me. That means nothing. People like us who believe in physics know that the distinction, distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent Illusion. I love that quote. And it was Niels Bohr that postulated quantum entanglement, which has now been uh, repeatedly validated through experimentation. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. It implies that space, or I should say the distance between points in space, is also a stubbornly persistent illusion. Whatever the case, if the end is the beginning and the way, then in reality there's no separation in space or time, and that means that reality is the uncaused cause. Science is the study of cause and effect in space-time. Technology is applying that knowledge such that we can choose to be the cause of the effects that we desire such that we can... Take control. I love science and technology, uh, 
But if reality is the uncaused cause, then I can, in reality, do nothing. <laughs> and if I think I can, I'm dreaming. Ecclesiastes 3.14, listen closely. I perceived, writes Solomon, supposedly the smartest guy in the world, wisest guy in the world, I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. And people struggle with that, how to translate that word forever right there, but go with it. Endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. God does everything. And anything that I do has already been done. And so if I am something that he has done, I have always been done. As if my life is eternal. Jesus said, um, apart from me, you, Peter, can do nothing. And Paul said, in Christ, in Jesus, I can do all things. So all my control is a temporal illusion, but in Christ I can do all things, and that truth is an eternal reality. It's the word of God. God I can't comprehend that. But it comprehends me. You know, when Becky was about five years old, the age that she was up in that video, I used to let her sit on my lap, put her hands on the steering wheel as I drove up the street to the mailbox. And then when we came home, she'd come running into the house yelling at Susan, Mommy, Mommy, guess what? I drove the van. And then Susie would, Susan, Susie, Susan would look incredulous and she'd say, Peter, is that true? Becky drove the van? And then with a huge smile on my face, delight in my voice, I'd say, Yes, yes, it's true. Becky drove the van. God asked Job, where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the morning stars sang together, were you there? I think the correct answer is, yes, I was in Jesus, sitting on your lap. Job must have been unaware of this wisdom as he reflected on his past worried about his future, and thought that he had been forsaken. But God spoke wisdom into Job, and Christ is that wisdom in flesh. Christ is the wisdom, the word, the will of God. He is the free will of God given to you. And in him, I think, you create all things. <sighs> That's what I call free will. If in reality the end is the beginning and the way who is Jesus, then reality looks like this. The body of a man. Call him Adam, because that's what Adam means. It means man or mankind. He's the beginning. The eschatos Adam said, I'm the beginning. And the end, which means that all of our timelines must look something like this. We are one Adam that became many Adams and Eves, but will be one in him, the eschatos Adam, the end. Or, actually, if the beginning is the end and the way, then all of our timelines look more like this, and we have always been in him. We were just unaware of what? That in him we live and move and have our being So if the end is the beginning and the way, then in reality there is... No separation. And reality is the uncaused cause. And the uncaused cause is a man who happens to be my friend. <laughs> Jesus. Got that? So Peter writes that he is at hand. The tell us of all things is at hand. And kind of in the Greek, at hand means at hand. So how is it that the tell us is at hand? 
We remember how the whole world, all the animals, were with Noah and his family as they traveled through judgment to the, to the new world. And remember how the age to come was with Israel in the Holy of Holies as they traveled to the age to come, even though they were, you know, always afraid to enter. And remember how I said that we discovered that the magic kingdom was in the van as we journeyed to the magic kingdom, even though we had to surrender Junction City and get in the van. How is it that the telos is at hand? Well, kind of like that. The van is in your heart. And hey, look, here's, here's a timeline. Here's the timeline. See it? Beginning in... And it's at hand. It's in my hand. If you existed on the timeline, if you existed in one dimension... You would be utterly, utterly unaware of other dimensions, like, like breadth. You would be one-dimensional uh, in a two-dimensional reality. If you were two-dimensional, you would be like a circle, that's two-dimensional, or a square, that's two-dimensional. And be utterly unaware of other dimensions, like three dimensions, like flatland. You could comprehend circles and squares, but you, you could not comprehend cubes, right? Uh, you could not comprehend uh, a sphere, for instance. Uh, but if a sphere were to intersect your world, suddenly you'd see a point. It would grow into a circle, then shrink and disappear. And you'd say, that was a miracle! And yet you would still have no concept of a sphere. You would see the sign, but you couldn't read it. You wouldn't know what it meant. But imagine if the people in Flatland could hear my voice and they said, that was a sphere! They'd say, oh, I get it. A sphere is a metaphor for a circle. And I would say, no. If anything, a circle is a metaphor for a sphere. In fact, a, a sphere actually contains an infinite number of circles, and if, if you don't believe me, you're like infinitely ignorant. And then the people with Flatland would say, you know, that voice is kind of annoying. We've sent out experts throughout all of Flatland and there is no cause for the voice. Therefore, the voice does not exist. It must be some sort of, I don't know, psychological coping mechanism for the reality of living in the land of cause and effect, uh, the survival of the fittest or whatever you, you, you want to say it. And I think to myself, man, I'm going to have to like descend into Junction City or something to get these people's attention. And, and then if they don't get it, well, they're just going to have to wait till the end of the line. <laughs> but I love them. You know, we exist in three dimensions, right? Or, or maybe four if you include time. And God created every dimension and he's bound by no dimensions. In him we live and move and have our being. He's the uncreated creator, which uh, must mean that he's always at hand. We're in him. And yet we're utterly unaware of his presence. And yet... Maybe he's more familiar than we know. What if God, like the Bible says, really is love? But we encounter love and we say, that's dopamine. That's testosterone. That's estrogen. Kind of like a flatlander would say, hey, you know, that's not a sphere. That's a circle. That's not a cube. That's a square. What if Jesus really is the truth? But we encounter him and, and just don't get into him because we think, well, uh, like a sentimental illusion. We're, we're into power, so maybe. What if Jesus really is the reason, but we encounter him and we think he's our reason? So we take him and we twist him and we use him however uh, we desire. What if he really is righteousness, but we've convinced ourselves that we are his creator? 
rather than the fact that we are created by the righteousness that is, that is him. What if we swim in the uncaused cause, but like a fish in the ocean, we have no idea what the ocean is. And if we talk about it, we possibly, well, maybe that's a concept in my brain. What if the uncaused cause is the cause of all that's done, and we think that if something is done, we're the cause? In other words, we're proud. Or if something is not done or undone, we're also the cause, and therefore we're ashamed and anxious, desperate and despairing. If that's the case, we would be interacting with reality like all the time, but trapped in our own reality as if we were drunk. Maybe we're all drunk. Not with wine, but with our egos. What is that? That's the belief that I am my own creator, savior, and redeemer. Maybe I'm interacting with Jesus all the time while I'm drunk on Mises and, and wheezes. Maybe we're, all, maybe we're all passed out. Maybe we're all asleep, having a bad dream that has turned into a nightmare, and getting in the van is waking from this dream, this illusion that we have constructed, and, and that's what a dream is, right? It's a world, it's a cosmos, which you alone have constructed, even if you dream about things that are, in fact, real. But they're all twisted. Before the fall, when Adam was alone and didn't know that he was alone, do you remember what happened? God put him into a deep sleep, a tardemal. I think he sent him on a journey. I don't think he fully wakes up until we each hear Jesus cry, it is finished from the tree that has been planted in the garden of the human soul. We wake from the dream and we say, oh, ah, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no, I dreamed of you and you are so much better than I ever imagined. A dream is a limitation in my ability to perceive reality. And so I'm trapped in a reality of my own creation. And maybe space-time is a limitation in my ability to perceive eternity. And so I'm trapped in an illusion that I am my own creator, savior, and redeemer. And so always alone and never at home in me. When I wake from a dream that has become a nightmare, I realize that the dream wasn't real. And yet, it was, I mean, for when you're in the dream, it's real, right? It, it wasn't real, and yet it was real because I dreamt it. It was the real absence of reason and truth and reality in a greater reality. But, but in the light of, of the waking world, all the chaos is transformed by logos, into gratitude. And I said, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. No place like home. And when I believe the gospel, well, I realize that all my sin is forgiven. All my darkness is flooded with light. All my lies are transformed by truth. All my shame becomes the very presence of grace. My fear is filled with faith, and I begin to worship. There's no one like you. No one like you. No one like you. All are one in you, and you are in all. You wanna know the very best pizza I ever had? I only experienced it for a moment, maybe a couple moments. It was deep dish Italian sausages, Pizza Hut pan pizza at, at the Pizza Hut in Frisco. After I got lost in the Gorange wilderness area and while shaking uncontrollably due to hypothermia, there was this moment that I was utterly aware of my own hunger, my own emptiness, and I had the knowledge of this emptiness, and in that very same moment, I was utterly aware of the food that was now filling it. I was utterly transfixed by and infinitely grateful for the presence of deep dish Italian sausage Pizza Hut pan pizza. 
But before I knew it, I was full. And it was only a memory in my past. What if that moment could be every moment? As if all temporal empty moments were constantly filled with like a river of eternal life. What if the moment we had knowledge of our sin was always the moment our sin was filled with mercy, the moment our darkness was filled with light, the moment our lies were filled with truth, our shame was filled with grace, that is, all our knowledge of evil was constantly filled with the living presence of the good who is our bridegroom. This is the plan for the fullness of time, writes Paul. What if we saw that the moment we took his life was the very moment he gave his life, that we would always know everything, everything, everything is grace. What if we knew that the moment we drew his blood is always the moment he gives his blood and each and every one of us is a member of his body? What if the life, because the life is in the blood, what if the life in your neighbor is the life in you and the very life of God? then you could live your life and your neighbor's life and God's life and you might actually love your neighbor as yourself because you would be like, my neighbor is myself and all your moments would be literally filled with the fullness of joy. They'd be magic. This magic moment. So different and so new, but like any other, until I kissed you. Now is the moment that eternity touches time, like a kiss. What if there are no moments that are lost, but every moment is filled with the presence of eternity, such that you're no longer a slave to space and time, and yet you could live all of space and time with the fullness of joy. Oh, man, that would be the magic kingdom. And in communion with Jesus, maybe we could begin to live it even right now. So what if the end of all things really is at hand? Okay, now our text for the day. 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of the telos of all things is at hand. Therefore, in other words, this matters. This should do something. Therefore, wake up. The best translation is wake up. Therefore, wake up and get sober for the sake of your prayers. Have you ever tried to pray with someone who's drunk? It's incredibly frustrating. I've tried it many times. It's so frustrating because they're just not dealing with you or reality. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, relentlessly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, you Israelites, as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very... It's not your grace. It's God's grace, and you are a steward of it, a dispenser of it. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So if you speak and you're not grateful that God spoke through you, then perhaps you didn't speak truth at all. If you serve and you're proud because of what you've done, then it seems that you haven't done anything at all. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order. Why? In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belongs the glory. Well, there's like one glory. The glory and the dominion into. Into is in the text. Ice. Into. And forever and ever is probably kind of inaccurate, but sort of accurate. If, if you mean by that the ions of the ions, the ages of the ages, Amen. Into the ages of the ages, amen. That would be eternity in every moment. In every age. For there is nowhere that the one van is not. Imagine if I got the kids in the van. And then I turn around to the kids and I said, Look, I'm going to the magic kingdom. And the two of you that love me most and that love each other the best on this journey, I'll take with me into the magic kingdom when we arrive. But the other two?
who don't love me most, who prove to not love each other best, I'll, I'll sell for medical testing when we get to Florida and you will never, ever, 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 ever see me again. If I said that, I doubt that they would love each other relentlessly or trust me at all. Although they would all pretend that they did. That's called religion. Human religion. But if I turned around and I said something like this, look, I'm taking all of you to the magic kingdom, even if it kills me. But none of us can arrive until all of us arrive because, well, you are my magic kingdom. That would be different. I didn't say either of those things, but I hope I communicated the latter of those things, or I should say God communicated it through me. For as I told you last time, I'm walking around the back of the van preparing my speech. I'm so embarrassed. You kids are just ungrateful. You, you better get it together. I'm going to cancel this whole damn trip. So I was walking around the back of the van. I had this thought. I, I think it was God. I think he said something to me, and that was, hey, Peter, now you know what it's like for me. You know, being your daddy. I think he was saying to me, hey, Peter, get in the van. You think you're driving the van. I'm always driving the van. But I'm letting you sit on my lap so we could drive the van. Peter, you filmed those moments because you were trying to capture those moments and then... You stop filming because it wasn't going your way. Peter, what you have perceived as so frustrating and embarrassing, as such a frustrating and embarrassing moment, is actually a magic moment. Peter, all of them are magic moments. Peter, I never stop filming. For I'm giving all the moments to you, and you can relive them for all eternity if you'd like. And Peter, on that day, you'll see me in every moment. I am the courage in Coleman's little fists. I am the dream in Becky's head. I'm the confidence in Elizabeth's voice. I am the deep contemplation in Jonathan's soul. And I am the faith, hope, and love that's rising in you and Susan and all creation right now. Peter, you know me. And I know you. And so the magic kingdom is familiar to you. And so we will all arrive safely at home, and you will know it when you do. Peter, it's all the magic kingdom. So get in the van. And check this out. I didn't need to do anything. For I was aware, suddenly, that everything was being done. The moment I realized that I needed to get in the van was the same moment that I realized I'm in the van. I'm home. And so if I remember correctly, I laughed with God. You know, Dorothy fell asleep in Kansas and she woke up in the very same place. It's all the magic kingdom, so get in the van. Here's the van. In three dimensions. <laughs> he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take it, eat it. In the same manner, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant, eternal covenant in my blood. Poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. So, he's calling you. Come forward, tear off a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and get in the van as the van gets into you. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, which is what that song was, I think dad says, ah, I've been waiting forever for you to ask me that. And I have always granted that. In the words of St. Paul, 
Oh, you said this to him too. You said, you know, if more of me means less of you, give you everything. Yeah, I give you everything. And then he says to you through St. Paul in Corinthians, all things are yours. You are Christ's and Christ is God's. Now, you tell most people that and they'll say, nice metaphor. <laughs> no! It's reality. So by way of benediction, this is all I'm saying. If you didn't track with the whole sermon, believe the gospel. Amen.